Jewish channels we can review. Barack Obama is re-elected. How did he do with the Jewish vote? Recovering from the devastation of Sandy, reports from the field, the famous songs you wouldn't know without this Jewish composer, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. President Barack Obama was re-elected to a second term as President of the United States on Tuesday, and here is a quick rundown of how Jewish and Israel issues fared. Approximately 70% of Jews voted for the president, according to exit polls. That's a drop in support from 2008 that more or less matches the general drop in support that the president received since his first election. The margins of error for Jewish results in exit polls can be quite large. In CNN's exit polling, a mere 2% of respondents were Jewish, whereas Jews typically make up twice that amount of the overall electorate. For voters overall, exit polls suggest the economy was by far the biggest issue, with 60% calling it their top concern. Foreign policy was the top concern for a mere 4%. In down-ballot races, the number of Jewish representatives and senators decreased. Two Jewish senators, Herb Kohl of Wisconsin and Joe Lieberman of Connecticut, are retiring. All four candidates in the races to replace them were not Jewish. No Jewish candidates picked up other seats, with the most prominent Jewish candidate being Ohio Republican Josh Mandel, who lost by an estimated five points to incumbent Democrat Sherrod Brown. Mandel will be returning to the statewide role he's held in recent years, that of state treasurer. In the House of Representatives, only one of the two California Jewish Democrats, Howard Berman and Brad Sherman, could return as redistricting pitted them against each other. Berman, who had been chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee during the last Democratic majority, lost to Sherman, who has maintained a seat in the House since 2003. Another Jewish Democrat, Shelley Berkeley, will lose her seat in the House after an unsuccessful bid for the Senate from Nevada. David Cicilline, the gay Italian Jewish Democratic member from Rhode Island, was re-elected in a tight race. And in newly elected Jewish representatives, Florida Democrat Lois Frankel beat Republican and fellow member of the tribe Adam Hasner, while Florida Democrat Alan Grayson is returning to the House after redistricting gave a more Democratic-leaning district for him to run in, following the loss of his previous seat in 2010. Massachusetts Democrat Barney Frank is retiring, with Arizona Democrat Gabriel Giffords having resigned earlier this year. All in all, the 213th Congress will have several fewer Jewish members than did the 212th, but the party distribution will remain largely the same, with House Majority Leader Eric Cantor remaining the only Jewish Republican in either chamber. Rabbi Shmuley Botea, who'd been running as a Republican in New Jersey, lost his race by nearly 50 points. Looking even further down the ballot, the race in the so-called Super Jewish District for a state Senate seat in New York that drew so much attention in the community saw victory for Democrat Simcha Felder over Republican David Starobin. Felder, however, has said he'll caucus with whichever party gains a majority. Moving beyond politics, as TJC viewers noticed, there was no TJC Weekly newscast last week. I and others at TJC who live in Lower Manhattan were without water, power, or heat as a result of Hurricane Sandy. Multiple TJC staff who live on Long Island face not only a power outage, but also a gasoline shortage. But even as most of our staff saw the personal crisis come to an end, communities facing longer-term effects were still struggling. TJC's Meredith Gansman visited the battered community of Seagate. Here's her report. This is the view of the Rockaways Seagate community from a Hurricane Sandy relief bus. Seagate was one of the hardest hit areas after the hurricane came through New York. Piles of debris, cars strewn in the middle of the street, and badly damaged, boarded up homes and businesses stretched for miles. And even on a bus filled with Jewish volunteers from a local synagogue, the reactions to the scene were shocking. She's uh, holy. These volunteers assembled at Congregation Beth Elohim in Park Slope, Brooklyn, to pack buses with donated food and supplies to be delivered to residents in Seagate's Jassa Senior Citizen Houses. This school bus was just filled with donated supplies from sandwiches and juice boxes, bottles of water and blankets that have now all been distributed to the residents inside the Jassa building, who, like many living in the Seagate community, can no longer leave their homes to get the resources themselves. Like most of Seagate that is without power, the high-rise building is without electricity and is running on generator power. There are no working elevators, leaving many senior citizens homebound. The volunteers walk to the stairs to each floor, knocking on doors to deliver the much-needed food to the hungry residents. 
One volunteer, Ari Corner, believed that the senior citizens felt neglected by the city as they struggled to survive after the storm. It seemed like they felt abandoned, so I would think that, you know, yes, the larger organizations aren't doing much as far as the governmental organizations. Uh, you know, and I was happy that I guess the local community was able to lend a hand. To see more from how Jewish volunteers are working in areas devastated by Hurricane Sandy, tune in to the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. The Riverdale Y in Bronx, New York, is serving as a central aid collection and distribution center for those who continue to be affected nearby. Christian Neiden reports. Some relief from the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy was available in the northern reaches of New York City last week at the Riverdale Y. Executive Director Marty Michael said the Jewish Community Center opened its doors to those in need starting last Wednesday morning and coming a little more than 24 hours after the storm. We opened the building free to the community. The schools were closed, so we invited families to come with their children. We had our gym set up with our big bounce castle and lots of gymnastics equipment and the kids. We had 500 people here uh, running around in the gym, swimming in our pool. Uh, we showed movies in our theater all day long, children's movies so families would come and sit in the theater and, and bop in and out and watch movies. Um, we were open for anyone in the community to take a hot shower, uh, recharge their cell phones, use our Wi-Fi in the lobby to uh, be in touch with, with family if they needed to. Um, the, com the outpouring from the community of gratitude for what a communi community center can be was spectacular. They were so grateful to have the Jewish Community Center open for them. On Monday, the Y was designated a warming center through the New York Department of Aging, and the center's chef, Ian Nerwin, did his part by providing hot soup, mushroom barley, and white bean to those chilly visitors coming in from the cold. So I came in, I made um, about soup for about 250 people, um, and uh, we, we had a few people come in, and, and then I think that's, uh, that's our role in the community. Uh, there's a lot of elderly people. Um, finding that uh, right now the biggest problem is gasoline, which is keeping people from coming here. Um, unfortunately, but um, I think as time goes on, people will know that we'll, we'll be open and we'll be here drink in times of crisis. And it's a place, if you can just get a bowl of soup and a fresh piece of bread, I think it's appreciated. To see more from the Riverdale Y, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Many other Jewish disaster relief efforts are underway, and we simply can't get cameras to all of them. One major effort took place in my community of the past eight years in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where more than 5,000 homes were without running water, power, or heat. The Volunteer Jewish Ambulance Corps Hatzalah evacuated at least several dozen elderly from buildings that no longer had elevator service. A general sense of community was obvious as people shared emergency supplies with each other without concern for cost or reimbursement. On Friday, the fifth day of the blackout in Lower Manhattan, Jewish groups were handing out kosher meals to all passers-by on the street. When I was walking alongside one non-Jewish man on the street at that time who'd obtained what he needed to feed his family, I heard him go on to tell other families in need that they could get food, quote, from those Jewish people handing out food down the block. A large out-of-town effort is being made in Maryland. Efforts there include a fundraising concert that generated $14,000 in relief funds, a bus that brought families down from the New York area for free hospitality on the Jewish Sabbath, and other large purchasing programs. Moving on to a famous fictional representation of helping someone in need, the story of little orphan Annie is known to all. And a new staging on Broadway brings the work of a legendary Jewish composer, as Meredith Gansman reports. one of the most famous musicals to ever be on Broadway and a new revival is open now. But I want to introduce you to the man who wrote this iconic music. The sun will come out tomorrow. Little Orphan Annie was first seen as a daily comic strip in 1924, but went on to become a star of the stage and screen. Annie the Musical opened on Broadway in 1977 and ran for nearly six years. 
A big screen movie came next in 1982, followed by a 1997 Broadway revival and a made-for-TV movie in 1999. And at every stop along the way, there was the composer of Annie, Charles Strauss. But Strauss's Jewish heritage keeps him very humble despite his success. Don't beshry it. <laughs> now, that meant that, uh, that God does not look uh, uh, happily down upon somebody who, uh, who accepts and uh, f feels deserving and all that. That's, so uh, in that respect, the, the, the Jewish or uh, old country part of my mother stays with me. But what makes songs like It's a Hard Knock Life, You're Never Fully Dressed Without a Smile, and of course, Tomorrow, hits? Not even Strauss has that answer. I don't know what buttons are pushed that enable bomb, bomb, bomb to be iconic or just simply three notes. Puccini did it regularly, Verdi did it a lot. Uh, I do, I do it very seldom, <laughs> but uh, when it does happen, it's, uh, I would say, it's, um, it's, ma it's magic. Annie's most famous song, Tomorrow, was originally intended not to stop the show, but instead to facilitate moving scenery. I would write a song, two, two and a half minutes, that would enable the set change to be made gotcha. behind this fence. Mm -hmm. And the first time uh, the song was performed, it got a tremendous hand. And I remember running back to Martin, who was in the back of the theater, and I said, they love that set change. <laughs> and I kept thinking that it was a set, because for a week they applauded the set change. <laughs> it was and it never set. occurred to me the song was going to be uh, that uh, penetrating. To hear more from composer Charles Strauss, tune into the full broadcast version of The Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, what would you do if, as a child, your mother moved you to a new town and ordered you to tell everyone you were actually a Christian? That's the wild story of the youth of author Theodore Ross, who recently embarked on a journey to find others struggling with a sense of Jewish identity, which he recounts in the book, Am I a Jew? Ross recently joined me for an in-studio interview. Here are the highlights. And it starts with a really crazy story, an insane story that is, that is frankly shocking about how your mother brought you up. That's right. Uh, I mean, the first sentence of the book is, I was nine years old when my mother forced me to convert to Christianity. And it, that's not, a, I mean, that's not literal, literal truth. I mean, I never actually converted to Christianity, but we moved when I, was, when I was nine from New York City to a small town in the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And my mother made the conscious decision when we were moving there that we would no longer tell people that we were Jewish. So I was sent to an Episcopal school um, where I studied the Bible and I sang in the choir and I took communion. And, uh, and if anybody asked me, uh, I told them that I was Unitarian. So that was sort of the, that was, that was my life as a child. So I was a, 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 hidden, a hidden Jew or a fake Christian in Mississippi while, while I was there. And when I would return back to New York to visit my father, my parents were divorced, uh, I returned to being sort of a fairly stereotypical secular New York, uh, you know, bagel eating, Knicks watching Jew. You know, and uh, that was my childhood. And throughout, you say, well, one of the surprising things is that you, you say you didn't really talk about this much throughout your later youth, throughout your early adulthood. You just kind of, it was just a part of you that you didn't really explore much. I didn't talk about it at all. Um, in fact, I mean, there were, there were several reasons for that. One of them being, as a child, that, you know, I didn't want anybody to know because it's such a strange story. And we were lying in Mississippi, so you couldn't turn around and admit to what you were doing. But then, even as an adult, I didn't talk about it because I did feel a great deal of distance both from that experience and from Judaism. So, for example, in the process of writing this book, I had to tell my father that we had done this stuff. Um, he didn't know. I mean, I'm 39 years old, I have three children, and he didn't know any of this stuff. Uh, 25 years after the fact, he had no, no I mean, clue he had inklings, but no, he didn't know the specifics of it. He, he, for example, knew that I went to this Episcopal school, but I think he assumed that I was the Jewish kid, you know, um, and I wasn't. And you use this as a launching pad to explore a lot of the more unusual, um, unusual manifestations of Judaism to try to see where you would fit in, you know, given your, given your interesting story. 
That's right. I mean, uh, that too was a conscious decision. I mean, there was, you know, I live in, in Park Slope, Brooklyn. There are plenty of temples. I could have walked into any of them on a, on a given, you know, uh, a day and said, Rabbi, what do you think? Am I Jewish? And it would have been as simply answered as that. But one of the things I started to realize about myself as I started to think about Judaism again was that I didn't really understand what that meant. And I, I don't believe that I'm all that unusual in that regard. Uh, there's a, a, a study that came out in 2010 called U.S. Jewry 2010. And it says that fully 60% of America's Jews don't um, have, a, have a denomination. They're not Reform or Orthodox or, or Conservative. They just consider themselves just Jewish. Right. So I think if you're in a context where that is the mainstream in Judaism, it is fair to ask, what does it mean to be Jewish? And to look for an answer to that, I wanted to go to the periphery. I wanted to get beyond that population of just Jewish and find places where the answers were a little bit more uh, stark and had greater consequence for people. You can see the full interview with Theodore Ross under the weekly news category on the Jewish Channel On Demand on cable. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Stay safe and be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.